I'm Brandon Amoroso, and this is the D2Z Podcast, building and growing your business from a Gen Z perspective. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to D2Z, a podcast about using the Gen Z mindset to grow your business. I'm Gen Z entrepreneur Brandon Amoroso, founder and president of Retention as a Service Agency, Electric. And today I'm talking with Richie Jones, CEO and founder of Vost. Richie has experienced both client side and agency life across multiple sectors. So I'm really excited to sort of dig into how his career has evolved to date and talk about all the really awesome sort of brand uh, that he's launched, touch on some of his agency experience, touch on some of his brand expertise, especially some of the low capital like entry uh, sort of tics, trips and tricks that you've done in the past. So um, without further ado, Richie, thanks for coming on. Uh, do you want to give everybody just a quick intro on yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks for having me. Um, yes, I'm Richie Jones, founder of Vast. Um, we set up Vast about five years ago, uh, but I've been in e-commerce, um, well, a good sort of 15, well, dare I say 20 years now. And uh, Vast exists to service brands that are looking to usually move in from the US market into the EMEA slash Europe uh, territory. And we've assembled a team of uh, amazing uh, e-commerce D2C practitioners uh, and uh, building out platforms, uh, mostly on Shopify, but also on, on Microsoft Power BI that means we can service those brands that bit better. And uh, yeah, lots of lots of kind of hacks and tricks that we're, we're learning along the way acquired over, over all these years, really. But yeah, vast, we, you would have heard of brands like Yeti. Uh, so we run Yeti in the whole of the Europe territory, Stance Socks, Jansport, Troily Designs, and one that's closer to where you are, Brandon, which is Florence Marine X, which is John John Florence's uh, own brand as a two times mm -hmm. world champion server. So that's, um, yeah, that's me. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, and for everybody listening, if, if you if it wasn't obvious, Richie's in the UK, it's five o'clock his time. I'm in Hawaii, it's 7 a.m. here. So I think this is the biggest time differential we ever had for, uh, for a podcast before. <laughs> um, and, and temperature and temperature as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, fascinating. I'd much prefer it to be evening right now, but I am very much so glad that it is warm here and not freezing. So I'll uh, yes, pro yeah, pros and percent. cons to both. So, uh, what exactly does Vast do? Yeah, so we, uh, if you imagine our, our kind of wider service, obviously we call it we call it three hundred and sixty service. We we will run an entire brand um, in in the European territory. So if they're not, if you take a brand like say Troy Lee Designs, where we've taken them, they didn't actually have a, a, a European e-commerce direct consumer presence at all. And we've set up their warehousing, um, customer service, the, the, the fairly obvious kind of DTC front end piece, which is their Shopify store. We actually run three stores for them across across Europe. And then we also run the inventory, merchandising, on-site trade management, all the way through to performance marketing, top of funnel brand building, all of those kind of key components uh, that you would need um, to be able to run a, run a brand in territory. And I think what we do is we, we short, can basically speed up uh, the pace in which a brand can grow because we've already got all of the understanding of the European market. So uh, we, we, we call it our virtuous cycle where we've got this ready made playbook and we can take a brand um, for many territory, increasingly we're getting brands from uh, mainland Europe as well, and apply our vast playbook, which is our standard way that we apply things to, to e-commerce, uh, and then basically accelerate their revenue. And our, our whole model is uh, based on a percentage revenue model, so we're incentivized as well to, to build and grow that brand. But crucially, we've got a firm eye on ensuring that we are always maintaining the, the brand equity of that brand as well. So we're not mm -hmm. massively reliant on the obvious levers of discount. Um, of, yes, there are moments when we will go into discount with certain brands, but on the whole, we trade them at full price and you know basically rely on the brand's amazing story and product to sell uh, what, what, we're, what we're doing. So we tend to work with brands for at least five years. Uh, we just had a load of brands that have extended with us as well. But it's all about, you know we, we can only really work with brands where we can demonstrate that long-term play and that's where we, we we demonstrate our best value for sure. And what are some of the for, for those who are listening that aren't familiar with the uh, the European sort of e-commerce market? What are some of the similarities and what are some of the differences um, or parallels rather from the U.S. market to the to the European market? 
Yeah, this is an awesome question. So, um, yeah, I mean, one of the one of the things about uh, if you imagine we've got twenty eight different countries that we operate in across Europe, and there's lots of individual nuances in each one of those European countries, especially when you look at the say the top five markets. One of the biggest uh, e-commerce markets uh, in Europe is is the UK. Um, I'd say the UK is much more alike to the US market than say the second largest, which is which is Germany. Um, the, one of the features of Europe compared to the US is that our population density is actually much, much higher. So if you imagine um, the, you've got these huge states with huge, you know, no one, not many people living in them, for example. And um, us, for example, have a um, next day, same day, even outside of a city is very common. So our distribution centers are very close to our population hub. So I know you guys would be, especially at this point in this time in the market where we're just before Christmas, you know, you'll see a lot of um, air, air um, freight upgrades in the US market. Whereas with us, we, we can do like next day, a very, very cost effective um, way uh, for, to the consumer. So I think one of the biggest differences is definitely the fact that we can get product to consumers much, much quicker. Sometimes same day, sometimes next day. And I think um, and I, I definitely as well, what's really interesting as well the, the, with the European market as well is that Amazon is super popular in the likes of UK. And that's almost driven that kind of consumer expectation of being able to get things the same day uh, versus say the French market where Amazon is actually, it's kind of frowned on in quite a, quite a dare I say, slightly snobby way. So you, there's more mm -hmm. of a reliance there where people will still tend to shop directly with the brand. So I think there's, um, I think the other big one, the US market, Google don't allow uh, brands or other brands to bid on your brand terms. Whereas in, the, in Europe they do. So we actually spend 30, 40% of a brand's uh, performance marketing spend literally on brand terms, defending the brand uh, as um, you know, if, if, if a brand's already sort of sold um, to online wholesalers, there's a real big chunk of that media spend we have to spend literally just defending the brand. And that's that's quite frustrating, uh, I have to say, mm -hmm. compared to the US market. I'm quite, quite jealous you guys don't have to do that for sure. So with the, I want to touch on the, the speed of, Sort of the delivery. So, are you you're staging product in in multiple warehouses? Then I assume. Yes, we do. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, you, you would have heard of the, the the dreaded Brexit situation we had here in in the UK. So, um, UK left European the European Union. Uh, was it just coming out two years ago now? Um, and that created all kinds of challenges for mainland Europe brands wanting to ship into the UK market. And the mainland Europe brands, it's usually if before Brexit, it was at least 50% of their revenue because the UK market is so e-commerce saturated. Um, then likewise, UK brands wanting to ship directly into the European market, it meant the consumer would actually have to pay customers costs in the same way, you know, if, you, if a US consumer bought something from a UK brand, exactly the same as that. So what we did is we've actually spun up, um, we've got UK warehousing, but we've also got warehousing in mainland Europe. We've got a, our main hub is just outside of Amsterdam. And Amsterdam, like the Netherlands in general, is a real hotbed for um, uh, e-commerce um, e commerce distribution, mostly because you can get still get next day into most of Germany from there as well. Uh, we do have a couple of hubs that we do spin up um, a little bit uh, around Germany if we need to as well, which uh, um, if it's a larger, a larger product, that's what we have to do sometimes. Got it, got it. So you've obviously been growing pretty quickly, I think. Um, you mentioned that Q4 this year is actually like record breaking for you guys. Um, so congrats on that. What, what are some of the, the things that you've done? Um, we can talk about like the actual sales growth and how you found the brands, but I'm almost more so curious about your internal team and how you've gone about sort of building that out. And then obviously as you've continued to scale, you've, been doing less and less of certain things that you probably were doing before. So what is the process of um, sort of documenting that and delegating it? What, what does that look like? And what are some of the, the things that have gone well and things that haven't gone well on that, on that journey? Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, it, it's, uh, we, we definitely, I'd say the feature of 2022 being, you know, the kind of great anniversary of COVID um, performance and all those kind of things that we're all really familiar with. Um, we've definitely kind of been growing up as a business in some senses. I, I think I'd 
I think I'd say we are going through our teenage years at the moment in terms of, you know, there's been some difficult lessons that we've learned. And I think um, one of the big focuses is that we've attracted some real talent to the business. And when in doing so, we also have that um, kind of pressure in some senses to demonstrate to them that this is an amazing business, an amazing company where they can grow and really learn like the absolute bleeding edge of e-commerce and, and diet to consumer. And what we've been doing at the same time as we've been growing the team is also developing our own um, internal uh, business intelligence tool that's built on Microsoft Power BI. It's, uh, it's catchily called Vast BI. There you go. And um, the, the whole idea of um, building things out in, in, on the Power BI platform is it's taking all of the kind of manual things that were happening in Excel in particular, putting it into a much bigger data set. We've got um, it's something like 32 million rows now in the Power BI solution. And crucially, um, speeding up reporting is in particular, so we get insights much, much quicker in terms of on-site performance. But the way we blend the data sets as well is so much more advanced than, com than compared to um, two things, the, the, the hassle of having to import that data manually, but then crucially blending that data in real time and getting insights. So I think for us, an example would be being able to track our sell-through rate data on our best performing lines in real time to be able to plot when we think we're going to set out of our performing lines um, has been a godsend. So we've been able to um, either switch our product from other channels like wholesale, for example, or corporate sales or, or, or the marketplace channel and, and keep fueling on in that sense that we're never going to be fragmented or out of, out of um, sales on our, on our key lines has been really, really helpful. But the crucial thing is we also link that stock and merchandising data to our performance marketing data. So we're not landing um, expensive uh, sessions, you know, that we've acquired via Meta or you know, Google Shopping or whatever mm -hmm. onto a page that has a product that's actually out of stock or is heavily fragmented. So we've been able to really get efficiencies on our performance marketing side of things by having that stock insight and blending those data sets together. And um, that in turn has led to us being able to understand our forward buys much better as well. So um, as we build out, more and more uh, a better data set of how our products have sold through we're able to then do more intelligent buyers in the future and um and this is where it's really tough for, you know what sells in the u.s market doesn't always sell in in the european market and where we have to be particularly cognizant of that is around say reselling of co collaborations you know licensed collaborations in particular you know um i was trying to think of a really good example um Oh, that's a good one. So, yeah, one of the ones that's gone uh, sold super well um, in Europe has been the Grinch, for example. Um, anything to do with the Grinch, you know, especially Q4. And I think in the US, I think Grinch is kind of has kind of maxed out. And if we were to use just US sell through eight data with the buying teams we talked to in the US, we get a read on there that would then be not. It wouldn't. It just wouldn't resonate in the European audience. Another example is. Um, the Grateful Dead, as in the band, it's quite big in the states. A lot of people know it on the West Coast yeah. in particular. We've got to be really careful with the, you know the California brands we deal with. They're not so big here in Europe, you know. So, but you know someone like Billie Eilish is. So we knew Billie Eilish would really really fly, and we we bought quite heavily into into the collabs that we've had with her along the way. So it's been um, that 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 kind of thing, like moving so moving like manual to our Power BI or Vast BI tool has been crucial. And I think the other thing that we've learned along the way as well is that we're, we are a Shopify um, design and build business, but we've got our own theme that we've developed as well. Uh, that's called Vastify. And the Vastify theme works super closely with what our trade team need. And we're, we're getting lots of insight because Shopify is brilliant. It's highly scalable. Out of the, out of the box, though, um, some kind of um, you know themes that you can get quite cheaply off the internet they don't actually perform that well when it comes to um, things like page load or even even the user experience, like things like filtering, really, really kind of simple things that when you want to get a bit more advanced with your trade plan. So we've built this whole Shopify theme out and we've just put it onto the new uh, store point 2.0 um, backend as well. And it just means like, things like sections everywhere and stuff just work that much a bit better. So the fact that our, you know, our merchant buying team along with the performance marketing team, along with what the tech team are doing as well, having that, kind of closing out that circle means that the sites that we've released this year, so we've managed to get Yeti onto our, our 2.0 solution. Um, Starnes goes early next year. 
We've also um, getting Jansport on there next year as well. Those efficiencies and the improvements, um, us being able to move away from the reliance on a lot of the apps on Shopify means that that user experience is so much better because the page load is so much better. We're getting two percent, sorry, two two seconds on our home pages versus a lot of the parent dot com brands will be around about eight seconds. So there's a, there's a considerable kind of user experience improvement on mobile, especially, which is good. Hopefully that answers yeah. the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean that that's a that's a crazy difference. Um, the eight per, or the eight seconds to to two seconds. What have some of the brands said to you yeah. about the difference between what they're seeing on the on the like parent company site versus what they're seeing on the on the European site? Yeah, we've we've, we've been trying. We've been very uh, dare I say British about it, and we haven't kind of bragged about it too much. It occasionally, kind of let we let slip on a, a certain technical call, but um, we, we've had people in some of the US teams go. Yeah, we've noticed your page load speed is super quick. How are you doing it? You know, and it's because we've got a, a great dev team who are obsessing over um, over optimization of, of that page load. You know, they've taken, in particular, we have some real bloat on um, filter, some of the filtering tech we've got on there. So they've been taking a lot, a lot of that out. But yeah, the US teams are really impressed. And actually, to the point where with Yeti, for example, um, they were so stoked with it that we've actually rolled out um, our... Shopify themes in Australia and New Zealand as well for them because they're so pleased. So yeah, it's it's just um, it's just great to see the tech being leveraged and the kind of concept that we can build out this playbook and deploy it anywhere with best practice in place is, is just really great to see for sure. Yeah, I think having that playbook, having something that can be easy, not not easily but but can be replicated into different um, markets or with different brands, it's a big value add. And I think you mentioned it earlier on the call. That's why oh, all these companies work with you because you can plug them into the European market right away with everything from the actual website all the way through the handling of sort of fulfillment and logistics. And for them to spin up their own uh, sort of presence would be extremely cost um, prohibitive. Wouldn't, it just wouldn't make sense. It would be a distraction and something that they have to learn. There was another company that I... Um, was looking at that does the same thing uh, for retail in the US. So they have yeah. basically the full like go to market retail team. If you want to start having your own stores, like they'll set up five of them in like key locations across the US. They have the leases, they have everything. And you're basically just plugging into their system. And that's a great way for you to sort of prove out concept to see if retail is something you really want to go heavily into. Um, is there a point at which brands should stop working with you and start doing it themselves. Yeah, that's that's a great question actually. And in the sense of um, that's it's actually our biggest our, our biggest competitor often is the risk where we get so successful and our performance model actually makes us quite um, exposed to that as well. Because we we will when we're first talking to a brand, we we have a whole P and L model that we build out with them using our knowledge of the you know, the European market and also. What we what we know can happen if we apply the, the playbook to it. What kind of growth we think we can get? Um, what we've done is we have built our model so that our commission actually starts tearing out when a certain level of top line ach achieved is achieved. So we ne we never sort of start to over earn. Um, we cover our cost. We, we you know we, we sort of uh, make sure we're making a profit, but we never kind of go over the top in terms of what we actually make from a brand. Um, we do have a situation where um, yeah, and that's that seems to work quite well and. You know the brands that with us that are still with us that have gone beyond those initial three year terms. It's been very much that thing where we we have a there is a a topped out commission level that we can earn, but then sometimes a bonus structure in there as well because they still want to incentivize us if we sort of hit certain key big milestones. That's definitely it. Um, but I, I think the, the for us the biggest sign of success is if a brand stays with us, and some of that is on us to demonstrate our core value. Our core value is. Uh, relent, relentless R and D, and if the brand can identify that we are doing, and we're not standing still, we're just constantly iterating the, the on-site performance experience for a for a consumer. We're constantly looking for incremental benefits and efficiencies with performance marketing. We're trying out new platforms. We're trying, you know just new ways of talking to the consumer all the time. If we can keep on basically being one step in front of where the brand is, that's where the value is. And I think. Um, We've built so much value now in Vast BI that, again, even in the same way that 
yeah, look, it, it probably cost the brand about a million US dollars if they wanted to set up a proper team in Europe. It's about that number, you know, e-commerce director, D2C director, team of 10 underneath it. You start building out offices, you pay the back, everything else, you know. Um, once we can we can make that, that cost is much, much less when people start working with us. It's, it's, in fact, it's, it's minuscule really compared to that kind of a number. Um, but we've invested many more millions in that vast bi platform now so we like to think that once a brand has got in and so is so used to seeing our reporting because they can log into power bi any time of day they want to because it's on microsoft it's got a great um app as well so you can talk to it when you're driving if you want get siri commands ask what's the selfie rate on you know you can literally just interrogate it the whole way when you're driving somewhere it's quite fun um i think yeah, for brands to replicate that sophistication we've now got in, in Vast BI is a real tricky thing because I should mention as well, we've actually extended uh, the Vast BI tool to other channels as well. So it's on on the wholesale channel now as well. And we actually blend wholesale data with online data as well to demonstrate to brands whether the doors they've opened are actually doing good things for their brand. Are they driving brand equity? Or did that door, for example, go markdown in the first you know three or four weeks of a new season which is always a bad indicator that perhaps they're either chasing cash or they're not the right sort of door so that kind of blending of data as well it costs you know a brand a lot of money to develop that kind of tech so we're in this kind of like constant arms race and i think um what's fascinating is just seeing how far behind a lot of the brands are in in the application of this sort of advanced um, business intelligence thinking you know, we're really familiar with the Amazons and Zalandos and, and big ASOS players of this world having this big data piece that they're using to optimize their stock profile, but brands haven't quite got to that yet. And that's where we think as a business, we can we can really help a lot of brands, like even some of the biggest ones out there. I mean, we, we work with Jansport, which are part of VF, obviously VF who own North Face, you know, all the rest of it, Vans, all that kind of stuff. Their demand planning is pretty sophisticated, but they're not looking at those data sets where they're blending the on-site data with the off offline kind of merge data. So that's why we think there's such a great opportunity for it. What, and, and that's a really interesting sort of use case to be able to sort of make your position more defensible by building out technology that you can then leverage for insights that they're not going to be able to replicate. Like they can maybe replicate the team because that's like people capital but all of the R and D that has gone into your your investment um, or into your technology is is definitely something that is defensible and and valuable to them. But what what are some of the things that you look for? And are you sourcing the brands typically from the U.S. to get them into Europe? Are they coming to you? And at what point does it make sense to go to Europe? Because if you're only doing yeah, it's know, a couple million in sales in the U.S., does it really make sense to try and uh, yeah. go international yet? Yeah, well, we, we like to think with our model, because it's low capital entry in, into market, we like to think that some we, we are attracting brands perhaps 18 months, two years before they would have normally done it. Um, I mean, certainly in the case of Yeti, we got them into territory probably about 18 months before they were thinking they would be able to do it, which is really great. Um, in the early days, it was word of mouth that the, the brands were coming to us. There's a lot of brands that still come to us through word of mouth. But what we're doing now increasingly is we've got our own uh, vlog series uh, that we've been running um, in association with a, it's actually a West Coast industry publication called Shop Eat Surf. That's been wonderful for us. We've had a lot of exposure off the back of that and, and won some brands off it as well. But increasingly, we're doing yeah, we're, we're guesting on more and more, more podcasts just like this one and just raising awareness, going out with kind of thought leadership on what it's like to trade direct to consumer, um, even open stores, to your point, um, in, in, in Europe. We, it, before COVID, we actually used to run three stores as well. And the back end was Shopify, so it didn't, didn't really matter. You know, the fact it was a, an actual physical store, it didn't really make any difference to us. Um, and we also do marketplaces on Amazon as well. So us doing kind of thought leadership blog pieces um raising our profile that way has worked really well for us because we yeah there's a lot of a lot of brands literally do not know where to start and that's that's where the opportunity for us is definitely and what sort of revenue amount in the us do you uh, typically yeah see? so 
Yeah, so we typically, we normally start to pick up brands around about the 75 million US dollar turnover level. Um, usually, sometimes it can be higher, usually about 100 million. Uh, that usually translates to what we think we can get them to, say, in the European market. You know, usually um, if a brand's at 100 million, you should have, the, you know, ideally within a couple of years, have a European kind of turnover, at least about 10 million. So you're going to be adding another incremental 10 mil to that top line. Um, yeah, if you look at some of the most mature uh, overseas, like US brands, um, you know, what they're achieving in, in terms of international revenue, you know, you've got these Ni the Nikes of this world that actually their non-US revenue now is much bigger than US revenue. So they're up, sort of up around 60% of their revenue is, is non-US. Um, Yeti at around about 9 or 10% um, stance, probably a little bit, little bit more than that. So it's... Um, it's one of the big things you find with listed businesses, especially is that they always want to see listed or high growth businesses. The investors always want to see, right, okay, you stabilize your US market. You've, you've established who your, your target audience is. You've tried out multiple categories with that audience. Your next big opportunity is then take that to Europe or take it to main, to take it, you know, overseas. And I think there's a lot of investor pressure often, um, uh, when they hit that magic sort of 100 million mark to get to be able to evidence they've got a whole international strategy and it's quite challenging for a brand especially just a us west coast brand where they're quite familiar with you know the product set can be quite seasonal um it can present challenges coming into europe sometimes and we we actually help them with the whole localization side of things as well especially around marketing messaging so um you know the a us brand will use language that's not quite appropriate for the european audience for example so not only do we do translations we also change some of the messaging they have around how the brand talks as well um yeah things like uh the, the very kind of texan use of the word y'all for example um doesn't yeah. resonate to someone walking down the parisian high street or you know someone in munich or in italy or whatever you know if anything there's a certainly outside of the uk and mainland europe there's a you want to you really want to dial back the americana because that's they don't like that as much, whereas the UK they're not as as, as uh, sort of offended by it. So we've actually retranslated some of the things into the European market, and it's it's fascinating. The um, if you if you just tweak it ever so slightly, but the example I always use is uh, if you take so in the Netherlands they have a national holiday that's called King's Day, and the mm -hmm. um, the national colour um, in the Netherlands is on that day is actually this colour here is orange. So um, Yeti happened to have a orange uh, drinkware kind of range, and um, yeah. we repurposed King's Day with a big push on their their kind of, kind of orange color set, which is a great way of just kind of repurposing the brand in to make it resonate with that uh, that target audience. Yeah, and I think that right there is a great example of how you are really providing a lot of value to to brands. Like, how would anybody in the U.S. unless they've been to Amsterdam a bunch? Or the Netherlands, how would they know that piece of information? And then I think it's really interesting for you to look at yeah. here's what's already in place. How can we maybe repurpose it a little bit or put a put our own spin or flair on it to make it more uh, specific to a certain market? And I think it's interesting to look at the the US and, and European market because even though in Europe um, it's technically different countries. And in the U.S., it's the different states. I mean, the difference between, I don't know, Alabama and California or a Washington and a Florida or a Wyoming and somebody living in New York, like they might as well be different countries. So I think you have some similarities in the U.S. as well, where you can't talk to every U.S. consumer in, in the same way. And if you try to talk to everyone, you're yeah. going to be talking to no one. So it's a very important I think piece of advice for, for anyone, whether they're looking to go international or just trying to speak to their consumers in a, in a more effective way. Yeah, no, definitely. And I, 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 that's absolutely right. And I think the, the other big kind of uh, mistake that some brands can make when they're trying to do it on the cheap is not spending the right amount of budget or investing correctly in translation. So if you imagine, mm. I mean, on that, to that point, right, you take the, take the um how informal um especially in lifestyle brands where we work how informal the language can be sometimes around the marketing messaging and in germany in particular they got like formal and informal versions of not versions or 
um, modes of how their language is, is structured. And if you go to an agency, a translation agency that doesn't bother to learn, we, we obviously run all the translation bits ourselves, but if they don't bother to learn the brand nuances and they start to translate really informal, like a surf brand into like formal, it, it's, it's like almost shouting at the consumer. They're like, you know, we you know, buy our product now in a really German shouty way, you know? And that's the <laughs> worst thing you can do because it, it will then show up um, in a kind of comedy way in that market and really devalue the brand. So that happens if you use like the automated translation services as well, like Google Translate. Just, just don't, just do not do it. Like go to a decent brand agency or decent translation agency that will go, that will take on board the kind of what we call the brand glossary. They will look, they will work out what, what, um, what products to translate, which ones not to, but crucially understand what is the tone of voice of the brand so that it resonates with that target, you know, local language in a way that is really valuable. So, um, that's one of the big learnings. And, it, and likewise, that extends to the performance marketing as well, because you want to make sure your performance marketing is translated because then you unlock brand new translated impressions that increases your kind of your reach then with the audiences as well. But again, just make sure that that messaging, you know, your ad copy isn't like comedy and stupid, you know, it comes coming across in a way that's going to make the consumer like either great with the consumer or devalue the brand worse. Because, you know, we all know you've got one chance to make that impression, especially if you need to brand. Yeah. I, I think I've seen a couple of, um, I think I saw an article on the internet about some funny, uh, like mistranslations where it meant one thing in, the, in another language. And then you just sort of sloppily threw up the translated copy into an ad and it meant something very much so yeah. not what you thought it would mean. Um, and totally. some of them, yeah. so, some of them were like funny and sort of comical. Some of them were funny, but also not funny because it meant something that was either like offensive or um it definitely definitely was not producing results for the brand i can tell you that yeah yeah no definitely well we had it um yeah we, we actually have we actually have got a, a little network of of um we get we've got a translation partner we work with but then we've got a network of people that we run it through as past you know it'll run past the, the translations in each country and um some of them uh our, our french contacts in particular are, are so passionate about the language not not being abused in some senses and they, they get offended if they receive an email from a brand they love that is not got the right tonality to it so because it is so it's, it's so um because likewise if you do it really well that resonates even better with a consumer of course and then they get they're blown away by going wow this brand have really this us-based brand have taken their time to understand a real subtle nuance of our language and are now using it in a really great way so it is it does present an opportunity but just don't use Google kind of translate. That's, that's all I ever say. <laughs> Never do it. It's just asking for trouble for sure. Um, what, one thing I've been thinking about, cause we have a couple of brands that we work with where they have a U.S. presence. It's pretty sizable. They only have warehouses in the U S but then they want to go international. And so they'll work with, um, I think there's a company called like Zonos or, or, or something. I can't remember who the major players are. But essentially, every consumer is still transacting through the U.S. site, and it's still going through the U.S. logistics, but then they're shipping it overseas. And um, I'd like to get your thoughts on that, because I think it's an awful customer experience. Like, it's terrible. Like, you would get your product from DHL in three weeks, and then you have to pay for the cost, too, and there's it's always confusion around that. And then whether the product was damaged in transit or not, and there's just... I feel like you actually might be doing more harm than good to the brand long term by just throwing something up like that versus yep. saying, yes, we are going to have a European presence and let's move forward with somebody like you. Or if we're big enough, go and try and do it ourselves and actually have a real like uh, presence in that in that in that country. Yep. Yeah, no, it, it, it's a. It's a, it's a scenario we are familiar with, and I'm glad you said that the consumer experience is, is compromised. It absolutely is. And I think um, what we find is there's, sometimes a brand will almost go MVP. Let's just, let's just knock this out. Let's see if we can acquire customers this way as a, as a kind of proof of concept with a view to then either setting up a, a local European office and putting proper sticks on the ground and, and um, deploying a local team, or ideally, in our case, you know, coming to us and, and, and us being able to you know, get them established in the market in the, in the right sort of way. But are uh, you right? I mean, the actual customer experience um, 
it's dreadful. And uh, the time it takes for, the, for it to arrive, the returns process is, is appalling as well. Because that's the big challenge as well. If the consumer, like we're really used, we're really used to in Europe having free returns. Um, as a, just a known thing. And a lot of these guys using um, some of these remote shipping solutions just are having you know, real difficulties in terms of returning as well. And, and um, what they're doing is also going live with performance marketing that's not tailored for the local market as well. So again, it's the US team. They've, 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 put, they've installed this really simple solution that means they can get into Europe or into anywhere else in the world for that matter. But then they often start plugging in US Creative that has the wrong spellings for things like color on it. You know, the, we spell color differently. You know, um, we, we have a different name for pants. You know, all these really obvious things are putting this, they're pumping US impressions into the European market. And so the, the media efficiency must be appalling. And then when you actually capture the client, the, 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 the consumer on site, um, it's not the best either. So I think. It's something we're familiar with switching out. And actually we've got a couple of kind of case studies where we've taken uh, brands that where we can see the conversion rate um, using one of these remote shipping solutions is usually around about 0.02%. That's kind of average. And um, we've taken it out from a 0.02% to you know, a, a full year average. This is a, a normal retail brand of between three and 6%. In Q4, it's more like, you know, you can be in double digits. So it's, um, it's that demonstration, but the crucial thing is what happens when you switch out a consumer that way is that if you if you get that product to them next day or they you know and they have a great shipping experience, they're going to repeat. That's the crucial thing. And what we what we focus on because we've got this whole thing around I haven't mentioned it yet. It's called direct for consumer, which is this whole focus on making the brand experience as possible as, as good as possible, with a view to ensuring that that consumer opts into marketing crucially and sees the value of opting in but crucially repeats. And that's the key thing, because we all know if you if you track light on value um, and the consumer repeats three times in that first half year, you know, you can be nicely in profit from a performance marketing point of view. Whereas if it's a massively compromised user experience, there's no way they're going to buy again. No way. <laughs> they would have taken a punt on you anyway, you know? So, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm a bit <laughs> rude, rude about those particular suppliers. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it, it it's, it's interesting because you it's cheap to like, just do it. It's very low cost to just sort of throw it up and say, yes, we're going to start doing this. But then there's all of these, like all the points you were mentioning, your, your performance advertising becomes much less effective. And so that has increased costs there. You have increased costs in fulfillment. Like there's all these other areas that it sort of trickles down into and makes those costs so much more expensive. And then uh, we haven't done, I don't know, let's say like a cohort analysis of all Poland customers for um, this one particular US-based brand that I'm thinking about. But I can almost guarantee you that the repeat purchase rate is probably 10% at best. And uh, if anything, it's just sort yeah. of engendering neg negative consumer sentiment than it is doing anything, than it is doing anything positive. So um, I think... Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, even exactly. Not knowing and, and, and they're actually... Yeah, so go on. I was gonna say, even not knowing, like necessarily your 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 solution before getting on this call and, and getting on on the podcast with you, it's clear that you're addressing a need here because this is something that I've been thinking about, regardless of um, being introduced to to you and the work that you're doing. So it's a, I think it's a pretty unique model, Leo. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, absolutely. And I think, and I think. Um... Yeah, the other thing about using a solution like that as well is that if you think the concept is to get a read of what the opportunity is in territory, you're not even getting a, a decent read because you're, all you're doing is getting a read of, oh, right, if we deploy a really compromised user experience, this is what we think we can make. So it it's not even, doesn't even work that way either. So it, all it does is damage the brand, unfortunately. So uh, we, we, we try and encourage brands to leapfrog that stage and just come straight into what we do. Yeah. That makes sense. If we can. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on. This is a super interesting conversation. I think there's going to be a lot of uh, sort of tips and tricks and just general advice that brands can take out of this, whether they're thinking about going international or not. Um, what is one, I guess, sort of last thing that you would uh, want somebody listening to this to, to think about or to know? Um, basically, the, the floor is yours. 
What's one thing? Um, one thing I would say, um, always assume with Europe, uh, just think of it as many countries with many individual customs and um, habits by country. And that in itself, if you tailor your strategy to all those different nuances by country, you will win. Mm. That's the key thing. And um, and it doesn't have to be too arduous. You just 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 need to think about it a bit and make sure that you're pandering to some bigger markets. But I I would just say uh, yeah, always think of Europe as a as a many many countries. Um, you know we've got a the, the combined um, sort of GDP of uh, the European Union itself is somewhere up at around like three hundred billion. But it's uh, there's lots of other smaller smaller countries within that you know combined GDP. So that's the opportunity I'd say. Sure. And it's all for the taking. There's so much opportunity over here. That's what I say. Coming from the US, it was really valuable to have somebody like you to navigate where is the actual opportunity. Like is Europe, you mentioned, is 360 billion GDP. Maybe there's one or two markets, though, that you want to start in first before expanding. Based off of the product type, is there going to be certain areas or categories where it makes more sense to do your launch? All of that sort of uh, on the ground knowledge that you have that nobody could could even begin to um, understand from, from the U.S. I think that's that's super important. Well, thank you so yeah, much for joining absolutely. us. Um, I'm going to drop it in the show notes where people could find you online. But uh, just really quickly, could you let everybody know uh, the best place to reach out to you if they wanted to get in touch? Yeah, sure. Um, web, web address is just uh, vast, which is about double v a s t dot net, and you can look up on LinkedIn. I'm just Richie Jones Vast. You'll see we we see we come up on that one. That's the best place to get me. But uh, yeah, um, it'd be great to hear from anybody, really, for sure. Awesome. Well, uh, as always, this is Brandon Amoroso. You can find me at brandonamoroso.com or electricmarketing.com. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Richie, for coming on. And uh, I'll see you all next time.